Here we are again with Jay's distribution class. I'm Zach. We have Jay teaching it. We have our wonderful guests. And then I'm tell us who you are. David. Isabella. <laughs> Chad Williams. Matthias Kronkow. And yes. And Matthias just made a documentary, finished completed documentary. So Matthias produced it, directed, voiced over. Chad. No, 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 let's, let's just get this clear. Okay. Chad actually made the movie. <laughs> he actually slaved over the hot Adobe premiere. And, and it, yeah, it was just ghastly to watch him. The sweat pouring from every opening. Well, I'm assuming I didn't see every opening. And he actually hewn this thing from, from the ether into something that people could watch uh, in electronic form. Now, I just sat there and said, no, do this. No, do that. No, exactly. do this. No, do that. That's the way it works. That's our relationship. And so, frankly, uh, that's how that <laughs> happened. And uh, I was a horrible taskmaster and a pain in the ass and made him cry on at least three occasions. I opened me Then he made me cry on four or five occasions. So it was a, it was a murderous and painful process that was worse than passing a break. It was almost like watching a theater being torn down. <laughs> and now we're going to go have lunch after this. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe. maybe. Yeah. So, so tell us what it's about. The Alhambra... The, well, the documentary is obviously about the Alhambra Theater that was once here in this beautiful location. Perhaps you can see the fountain that was part of it once. Uh, it, it's been a subject that has stayed in Sacramento ever since the theater was torn down in 1973. And amazingly, not a lot of material produced about it. And so we were asked by uh, Matthias's friend, Wendell Jacob of Davis, to produce a film about the Alhambra because it was a place that had meant a lot to him and people he knew and he's an old theater guy and projectionist and said look why don't you guys I'll give you a budget and make go make this film that needs to be made so that's how that happened. So um, you've done two films before this. Right the first was the Sacramento picture made in partnership with the Center for Sacramento History which is a city county agency which has remarkably nine million feet of movie film in 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter film. It comprises the collections of the city and the county that you would normally think of, like training movies, films used by the school system, but it also has an inordinate number of films that have been donated over the years by private families, home movies, early films of the region going back to 1910, like the Horst family and their hop farms, which were over in Campus Commons. So those are really remarkable assets they have. Compounded with that is the entire news film collection of KOVR and KCRA television in the days when nightly TV news, all the stories were shot on 16 millimeter film. And it was complicated because some of the time it wasn't an optical soundtrack, they had a magnetic track. So they have two pieces of film that would correspond to a news story. They would have the audio on one piece of film, which they called the brown film, because it was entirely full coat magnetic stripe. And then they would have the picture. And if you don't have those playing in synchronization, you don't have sound and picture at the same time on the special machines TV stations had to render them. So if you imagine the nightly news for every single night from 1957 to 1980, that's a lot of film. And that's where they get 9 million feet of movie film. So in both their first uh, project that we worked with together in Sacramento Picture, where we used all of this footage to sort of tell a story of Sacramento between 1910 and about 1974. Uh, we and thought at that time, well, of course, part of the story of this city is the Alhambra Theater. But we knew then that it was such an expansive topic, not only because it was a cool place, but the sort of David and Goliath way that it met its demise, which could be a mini-series by itself, that we couldn't tell that in that movie. And so we sort of shelved the idea, well, we could do an Alhambra movie later if someone writes a check. We later, uh, uh, was relatively successful locally, the Sacramento picture had numerous showings. We managed to sell out every time at the Crocker Art Museum, the Tower Theater. Uh, we had screenings at the center itself and, and somewhere else we had a screening. Oh, the state, the state library and the state archives uh, had a screening during history. So it's, it's quite appreciated locally for the rare images that you see. We then went on a project of studying NBC because as a, when I managed the Crest Theater from 1986 to 91, uh, we brought that back uh, when it was closed on K Street. And we had had in the booth a film, a 35 millimeter film print that belonged to a projectionist called Behind Your Radio Dial, which was a 20 minute 35 millimeter movie 
made in 1948 about NBC Radio. At the pivotal point when NBC in New York at Rockefeller Center, where Saturday Night Live still broadcast from, made the switch from radio to television. And before the internet, radio networks were the equivalent of the World Wide Web of that era because information was disseminated from central hubs and went to all of their affiliate stations in the same way the World Wide Web connect. So we made this analogy and decided let's do a documentary about this movie about NBC and we did it just in time for their 90th anniversary. And so we had lost the film print that had been at the crest and I had spent a long time looking for it because in the meantime Chad and I were doing online movie review content called Matthias Bumball's Hollywood, and the whole sequence opens with scenes from this NBC movie to give the viewer the illusion that our radio studio, where I do these interviews from, is in this giant broadcasting facility when it really was my garage, which burned down on August 7th. So <laughs> we lost all that equipment, but we still have that rare film, and we said, you know, now that we found, miraculously, a mint condition 35 millimeter print of this film, we had it restored, and we said, now that we have this, for the purpose of including these few shots in our title sequence for our movie reviews, let's do something with it. And so we made this NBC documentary, it took us about a year, and the market is somewhat limited, you know, it's right. going to be old engineered geeks that like old time radio, but those people love it. Uh, it. We couldn't find anybody alive to interview, so it's just me sitting there talking like in a radio studio, so it does, it's not gripping emotionally, but for data, man, it's great. So, and I love it. I do love it, um, and I still love it. It's just not a money maker. So, so that's that's a good point. So, the first one was financed from the city somehow, or well, no, we uh, we they asked us to do it, and they gave us a humble offering, okay. which was about enough for lunch for all of us. Okay, all right. Uh, and um, that's <laughs> truly what it was. And then we did it because you know this is cool. We have access to these films. We figured, well, we'll copy some of this footage and use it for some other project. We you know we've got access to these nice. 2K transfers from film that are digitally done, so you see like downtown Sacramento looking like it did back in the day, and I'm sure we'll need this stock footage at a later time. So it was my secret plot to just amass a bunch of the stock footage while we had access. But they liked us, and they let us uh, uh, do okay, the thing, and then, so we made a great relationship there, which is still uh, quite good, because now they, they love the Alhambra film, of course, which we did with most of the news film in the film, comes from this Come collection from. at the Center for Sacramento History. I mean, because of it, people were able to see in our new movie what the Alhambra was like inside and in color, right. which is something that people have some sort of a nebulous idea of because it stood here for so long, but what was it like? And I think we were really able, I, Jay saw the movie, uh, was able to, to, to convey what the, what the place was like. So uh, that was, would have been impossible without access to that film. So show business is a business. Yes. What strategies did you learn from your first two projects going into a third project as far as like making a profit or ideas or do you have thoughts of that or we have thoughts of profit all the time the dollar <laughs> signs dance in our head we think man this is great we'll we'll find dates we'll have fancy cars we'll you know <laughs> no no that we haven't found a way to make a dime on this at all Sadly, I'm not trying to... Well, we've had two screenings at the at the tower. We did, but, you know, since the last film, which came into possibility because of the NBC movie, our financier saw the NBC movie, and he was one of those white-haired old men that loved it. So he got his checkbook out and said, how much do you want to make a movie, and what is the subject? And so we said, we can do the Alhambra movie now. He loved it because he had been at the Alhambra. He wrote us a fat check. <laughs> And we made the first movie. Time I so, ever had a budget. yeah, I know it's the first time we ever actually had a budget was with the Alhambra project. So we were thrilled, uh, but because it was work made for hire, it's not our movie. It belongs to Wendell Jacob. And so, fair enough. Any, you know, because we got was probably the most we've ever made out of a movie to this point in time. Uh, and so now, whatever profit it makes, it's his. Although he has, because he was impressed with our work after the premiere, given us an allowance to shop it around to private screenings and we can keep the receipts from that. So, so we'll have some income in the future, but certainly not enough to make another movie or even for you to find a place to live. Or, you know. <laughs> so you, you can guarantee that you will be couch surfing, you will be, you know, struggling to survive. But the bottom line is, does this career, does this ability to create something, does your technical skill that makes you good at what you do in telling stories, 
is that the course of your life? Are you going to follow that because you really give a shit about it? Or are you doing this because you're trying to find an avenue to make money? Because when it comes to a technician, a technician is a, a set of skills you can learn with Adobe, Adobe Premiere or whatever else. They're always changing, always going. You have to make it your life skill to, to adapt to the new ways that these programs are working and functioning. But anybody can do that. What just about anyone can't do these days, I think, but we hope that they will, we hope they embrace the possibility, is to tell stories. It's about telling stories. And it doesn't matter what the technical ability, if you have a story yeah. to tell and you can effectively make it, and the story connects with someone human in a human way, you're going to have a success because you will be able to connect with people if you keep it human and it's about something with which people can relate. Money, which is where they started, this is not a money thing. There are very few people that become incredibly successful. We saw them last night on television and uh, at, at the big statuette handout in Los Angeles. And some people make a career in the industry. But if you're going in thinking of money and doing it for those accolades, those promises of success, you're not doing it for the record. you got to be in there to do it for storytelling and telling stories. And Chad and I struggled to do it. We had a nice success with this now. We have no idea what we're going to do next. We're broke as hell, and we want to do something great. But we know we've touched people's yeah. lives, and that makes our lives worthwhile as human beings. You know, we still got our cup out, saying, help us, please, help us. It's just the way it is. It's a constant Boy, struggle. Boy, people like the film. So a that's constant struggle for money. And so if you're working in a team, it's great to align yourself as we have in our relationship. Chad is a technical genius. He knows how to do what he does. But he's not he's a shy guy. He's not gonna go schmooze at the Sutter Club for a big check to make a project. But I I'm well suited for that because it's a world in which I can travel more comfortably than Chad. I think it's still a nasty thing to ask you know, people for money. It's yeah. nobody likes to do it. Except mom, right? <laughs> mom, I don't have enough groceries. What do you can you do? Okay. How about some gas money, Mom? I mean, thank God for mothers. Yeah. <laughs> but so, Amen. This is not a very promising answer, is it? No, I, I, I'm not trying to depress you all. Please believe it, but you've got ideas, you've got cool things. I'm going to make an artistic observation now because I am a movie critic. Whatever you do in this, the way you tell your story, just remember you're telling a story. Don't let any aspect of your skill as a camera or your clever editing or your interviews where you've got the guy talking in the camera or just off camera and then suddenly you see some remote shot where you see the camera set up and the other guy talking. That's all stuff that pulls you away from the subject. It's what the subject is about. Yeah. So if you end up showing up, hey, I can edit this really coolly, then people are looking at your editing and not what's important. Sure. So find the way to be artistic and clever with your technology, but not that it draws attention from the subject. Because then you're not going to tell that story effectively. So you made a story. We did make a story. Um, Two sold-out screenings, but what is the future for this? How are, you, how, how are other people going to be able to see it in the future? What are your ideas for distribution? Well, Chad and I have a meeting on the 14th with KVIA Television. Okay. They are eager to show it on television, but they... Because it's an hour, an hour, five minutes, something like it's that? It's an hour and six minutes. However, okay. they want us to cut it to 56.45, okay. which we can do, and they want to show it. So we're thrilled about that. We're thrilled they want to show it on TV, and of course, once it gets on Channel 6, they'll show it like 128 times for whatever long the agreement period. On several channels. Right. On several channels. But they don't want to pay. <laughs> no. They don't want to pay anything. So. You're saying, well, great, I'll get some great exposure. Sure, but you'll die of exposure because you still can't put food on the table. So uh, <laughs> you need to have that other gig. Uh, so we have a meeting, and they even went as far to say they want to shop it to their national distributor Distribution, and put it on yeah. all sorts. So we're thrilled about that. Although I think at, at the 55-minute cut, story is not effect enough outside of this market because there's no element of relevant Nostalgia. No, it's just, it's it's about a Sacramento theater and people here in this market, it's like Lady Bird. Yeah. Lady Bird is huge in this market. But as you <laughs> saw last night, as much as they nominated her and applauded her, it just, you, you couldn't tell, she didn't tell the story as beautifully or cinematically effectively as Shape of Water, which was just so stunning. I mean, it was stunning in every aspect. And so it was, you know, good for her. She did it. We love her. But, you know, you have to think beyond the location, your local world. Tell a story that's universal, that yeah. somebody in Finland will understand, somebody in Yonkers will understand. Because uh, if you're looking at 
oh yeah, let's let's make it. Here we are in Sacramento. We want to show off our Tower Bridge. We want to show off this cool stuff. If you're only going to show it to your buddies that live in town, tell a story that's engaging all over the world, and then stick the Tower Bridge in there, and that's where they happen to be going. But don't give us a long, lingering, loving, poetic shot, because people say, why are we looking at this bridge? So what other options do you, get, do you have for distribution to get it out there? Well, Chad and I are going to theatrically distribute a slightly longer version. We wanted to get $30,000 more to extend it to 90 minutes. That doesn't mean we can't find it, which we'd like to find. Oh, that is sad. Wow. Wow. We're having a pause now because we have an iced coffee emergency. <laughs> this is brought to you by the Iced Coffee Emergency <laughs> Company of Safeway Stores Incorporated, based in Oakland. Uh, so, we're looking for theatrical, uh, creating a theatrical version. We're going to probably augment our version that they saw at the premiere by one or two minutes to put in a few extra things that we thought would give it a little bit better connectivity and to save the Alhambra sequence at the end because there's yeah. so much more. It's a little rushed, there. yeah. yeah. Um, and trim a few pieces from the front, perhaps. Um, I'd like to have seen a little bit more of the post. You didn't really go into the post post demolish right. era yeah. if, uh, is time wise or you just didn't want to go there or well we had some and we, we were just we were just as tough for time yeah we had deadlines that we had we d we met but it was tough to do we had a lot of stuff kind of just personal things going behind the scene that really cut into our time to edit it as we really wanted to so we were just trying to take all the parts that we knew we had <clears throat> and get them into a form that you could watch that made sense, but we knew that we were gonna end up expanding on it and hopefully uh, doing something more theatrical because there's so much more story there. And you're right, the stuff that happened after really isn't touched on. There are other eras that really didn't get touched on like we wanted to, and we have so much material <laughs> that we, we could we easily expect, make two hours, expect, yeah, but there's course. just no way to do that. So we have to really kind of nitpick and tell it as best we can with the time allowed and making sure that the story and the film itself still flow correctly. Uh, that's always my big thing. If it doesn't move, if it stays too long on one thing, it, it starts to feel wrong. So we tried to make it where we could at least touch on a bit of everything as much as we could. And in all fairness, he and I don't always agree. As a matter of fact, we almost never agree on when does something outstay its welcome on the screen. I always push for longer. He always just pushes for shorter. So this is a creative conflict that we constantly, constantly have. We, we respect each other, so that's why we're still alive today speaking, uh, instead of you know having had some strange double suicide. Yeah. But the, the reality <laughs> is, is that this is this is about compromise all the time, and I hate it. I hate it so much. <laughs> Chad, what do you mean you're wrong? But you're wrong. <laughs> it's better this way. And it, but it, you know we it works out in the end. I think. Uh, usually, if, if he's right, I'll see that he's right. Or if he has a, a view that, at first I'm like, no, you're full of it. But then I'll think about it, and he's right, and vice versa. Even earlier today, he goes, you know that one shot that I didn't like? I like it now. I'm like, okay. Yeah, he yeah. placed a shot at the end of the movie. I wanted to match my, my voiceover, which made for a perfect marriage of the shot and that voiceover. I had visualized it with the voiceover when I wrote the script. He put it at the end, and I thought it was much more effective at the end in retrospect. But I hated up until about today, and then finally today I said, "Yeah, that works." So it never stops. I mean, and, and it's, this is the great thing about any of these projects: you have to say, you have to stop at some point. Yeah. You have to stop because otherwise you'll be like Charlie Chaplin, who made his great silent film, The Gold Rush, in 1925, which was shot in Truckee and here in downtown Sacramento for a few scenes, and then. In 1942, he's no longer in love with the woman he kisses at the end of the film, so he recuts the whole film to eliminate the kiss at the end because he doesn't like her anymore. George Which is the definitive so version of his movie. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But no, yeah, we have we have other things that we, we really wanted to add to the end and just couldn't. There are more elements of the Safeway story. Uh, there was, you know, I was surprised at the balance uh, perspective that you provided. Like, I didn't know how lenient Safeway was. Like, I'd never heard that from all the people complaining about Alhambra being torn down. So uh, that's something I learned. Well, that's we, we, we intentionally tried to make it as fair, balanced as possible because it's not it wasn't our point to have an opinion. Although a filmmaker can certainly do that, and they do, because every filmmaker is already conditioning you to what they want you to see because 
you as filmmakers put the camera somewhere. And the camera, let's say if we have a medium shot of the Safeway sign, you see the Safeway with the S. But if we put the, shot the camera with a wider angle, you see the Safeway in the parking lot. So we're all standing here, we can see all of this. But in your film, are we looking at that light post that's right there, and that's where the shot opens? Or are we, look, we encompassing this, we, the activity of this parking lot too? Both images tell an entirely different story. It's a choice you're making as a filmmaker. And so you, in a way, limit the full perception of something when you create a film, because you're directing people down a path. To that degree, we're making choices artistically mostly. But in the case of the historical narrative, which is what you brought up, we wanted to be open-minded. And we also discovered in our research, which is so much of this project was research, I spent a year before we actually started cutting anything on Adobe, digging up every photo I could find, calling everybody I could figure out that had any connection to it, digging up graves, you know, you know <laughs> practically, <No way. laughs> to, to, to find this information. And in that process, here we discovered Safeway was not the bad guy. And so we had to tell that story. It t it be, as well, Chad and I often say, sometimes once you amass all the information in the case of a documentary on a historical subject, the story ends up telling itself. We just choose how to give you the information, yeah. but it's, it's 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 already there. The compelling, the, the fascinating thing, the things that had emotional impact were all things that happened in life, and we just had to remind people to trigger them of the, of the emotional impact. I talked to my psychiatrist today, who was at the premiere. And he never lived here, he had no connection to the city, and so an opinion like that's important to me. Because does the story motivate, grab, or interest you, or entertain you? For someone that had no connection whatsoever to the theater, never knew it was here, never knew, you know, he probably shops here all the time. Um, and he said, yeah, he, he was emotionally moved by the public response, that there was something this grand and we let it go. So that was a, a that was a moment of accomplishment for Chad and I to hear this from somebody that just had no connection whatsoever, and and one of the best comments that we had about the movie after the premiere was uh, from Donya Wicken, who said we had no idea how much Safeway tried to help make it possible for this theater to be saved. So we went right right after the movie we went and shopped at Safeway. So, no, it's okay <laughs> to shop at Safeway. Again. <laughs> We thought people would be angry with our movie because we had this manic yeah. approach. We thought people who had been telling the story, oh, I'll never step in that store again. I heard it ever since I was 18 years old. Yeah. All the time I heard it. And I said, these people are angry. They're angry for a legitimate reason because if they had experienced the theater in their youth, it symbolized more than a building. It became this, and I use this in the voiceover, it became a place where they enshrined their lost youth, the happiest moments yeah. of their lives, where they met and hung out with their future wife or their date or their lover or whatever. It was a place where people gathered and people had collective memory sharing. So it was very important. And to see it torn down or not there is to acknowledge that a part, the most wonderful point of your life, the most active part of your life as a youth, uh, and your first loves and things that affect you for the rest of your life, the, the very temple where these things occurred doesn't exist anymore. You're going to be angry about that because it's part of you that's being debunked and taken away. That's why this is such an emotionally charged movie and, and subject in the particular case of this film. And, and I, so people look at the safe way, they react to the emotion of, of some sense of loss, and the next reaction is anger. They're upset and they want to point that anger somewhere. And Safeway's big sign right there, Safeway. It's you. It, it's just, it's just the way people are because they want to respond viscerally, emotionally before looking at rationally the 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 facts. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, you pretty much summed everything up. Cool. We uh, wish you the greatest luck, guys. It's yeah. it's it's hard. It's a lot of hard work. Yeah. It's not a nine to five job. Chad and I were up till four or five every morning, sitting there yelling at each other. He's falling asleep on his keyboard. Uh, I, you know, was just, you know, I would be totally lethargic all day long, and then at three in the morning start panning. Let's him go. Here, let's go. He's going. How long was the process? How long? How long? Actual cutting? Yeah. Well, when you start acquiring stuff to a distribution year and, to. Uh, it was a year and five. Four or five months. A year and five months. A year and a half. Okay. Actual editing. We had to do it real fast. 
So deadlines are good. Yeah, that's what that weeks, four weeks. I cut that. Four, four weeks. weeks we cut. Wow. Like but we oh. had pre planning. We knew, yeah, he still hurts everyone. <laughs> the carpals. <laughs> we wish you guys luck. We really do. I mean, it's it's a cool thing if you're a storyteller and you can do stuff, oh, tell yeah. stories because this is the thing. Technology is always going to be changing on us. So be good at the storytelling. That's what's going to work. If you think about it, going back to the caveman days, before when there's movie film or lenses or anything, they were drawing these stick figures on cave walls, and that told a story, and it would linger to the next generation because they could point at the cave wall drawing. We're essentially doing the same thing. We're drawing on a cave wall. <laughs> so, cool. There you go. All right. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Every success. Yay. 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 So this is Eva. In person. There's some pedestrians. I see them. I'm just wondering if we should put them on the hood. <laughs> How's everything back there, alright? You're yeah, doing great. <laughs> so, where would the, I guess, the, the line have been for the, uh, the theater? Where, where the, 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 the line? I mean, from the building when it was doing that. Oh, well, right where Safeway's back wall is, was where yeah, the back that was wall the, the wall. Okay. That would have been the stage house. Gotcha. And, we'll go into the parking lot here and show you where the actual property is. We also <laughs> have we also have a country horn. Oh wow! Two horns. Yep, wow. Depending on the use. Oh wow! Nice. It's so nice. Seat we don't have seatbelts, so there's no way to do that. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Unrestricted. I don't feel bad at all now. <laughs> it's so nice to see her up and running. I know. So the auditorium would have been. I mean the. Right around where Safeway's front wall was, where the yeah. where the auditorium's front wall was, but right about here was the end of the garden. So the other fountain that matched the fountain on that side would have been approximately right here, and this from here over was the parking lot for the theater. Okay. Uh, so I, mean, I wonder if they had which a parking was, lot or not. Which was accessed by the same dimple in the road over here where these cars come in. So that was the entry to the parking lot, and then you would go in through the back of the garden to get up to the box office. You didn't have to go all the way out to the street and back up again. Was the entrance to the theater about where the entrance to Safeway is? Yes, so it was a half a block from this K Street. You had to walk up this long mall, and as you look at the line of concrete there where you see it raising up, that would have been the front lawn. And we'll show you on the fountain here some of the details that uh, might help illustrate this. So this was all yard originally, where this lady's walking was the uh, front, front yard of the theater. And she's right going to provide this, color commentary. Yes, right over here you'll see some wood paneling. Yes. That's at that point the, the theater's gardens wall came towards us. So oh. right there the wall actually came this way. Extended so out. from here forward was just lawn, and from here inside was the the Moorish themed garden. Isn't that exciting? Now where are we going? This is good. Yeah. Where's your car? Back there. Well, we'll go find it. Back there somewhere? <laughs> yeah. Tell me where and we'll go to it. Mm -hmm. Kind of back where you were parked. Oh, all right. I'll go back. There's Chad again. Where's Chad? This is more fun on the freeway at 110 miles an hour, but... 110? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. Well, it's got six cylinders. <laughs> two carburetors. Wow. You're back in there? Yeah, yeah. I'm right there. Black Twitter. Right with that man. People do like to just sit in front of this car and let it, you know, please run over me. No. <laughs> cool. Yay! Thank you for the tour. Yeah, thank you. It's great. Thank you so much.